Hey, Chris, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Uh, ben and myself, I see Michael on um, as well. So I think our side is all represented. Okay, we'll just wait another couple minutes for uh, residents to join here. Not um, a problem. We also have Tanya hopping on. She just, um, we ended our steering committee a few minutes ago. Well, I think we can get started. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. I'm Chris Michiki with the Wineland Park Community Civic Association. Um, today we have guys companies joining us so that we have a town hall so they can discuss the um, development at the corners of North 4th and East 5th Avenue. Um, just some housekeeping items. If you're not speaking, if you could keep yourself uh, muted. And um, if you do have any questions, um, either you can use the raised hand function, which should be in the uh, upper right hand corner, um, or you can utilize the chat if you want to maybe ask a question there. Um, not sure if we will be able to address everyone's questions and comments or any concerns that they may have regarding this development. I do believe that Geis will be um, going forth with the um, University Area Commission if folks are wanting to attend um, any of those upcoming meetings. Um, and um, I'll go ahead and uh, let Geis introduce themselves and uh, they can go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone, and thank you guys for taking the time on such a beautiful Ohio day um, to, to listen to our project. Um, and uh, I want to introduce myself, Brandon Klein uh, and Ben Brandon on um, we're with uh, Geis Companies. We're a design builder out of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, we are working on this project on behalf of our client, Michael Panzika, as the developer uh, with his partner, Russell Lamb. Um, this is one of a handful of projects that we've worked on with this development team uh, in different areas uh, of the region, um, but our first venture in the Columbus, uh, Columbus market uh, as a group. Um, and so uh, want to again, thank you guys for uh, taking the time to listen to us. Um, I know that uh, the group had asked us when we met informally uh, to introduce them to the project. Uh, the first question they asked is, what do we hope to get out of this? Um, which I think is very respectful and a very appropriate question. Um, I will say that as a group, uh, we're not uh, unfamiliar with the community uh, engagement process. Um, we all will strongly believe that it creates a uh, opportunity for nice interaction amongst neighbors. Um, and also, uh, I think projects become stronger uh, and, and fit in with uh, the fabric a little bit better uh, when this process is respected and, and, and utilized. Um, so we, we are coming here at a point where we'd like to hear feedback and, and understanding. Um, I'll be the first one to say that we can't always accommodate um, every request, but there is uh, things that we would be happy to kind of integrate and listen through and, and work to see how we can integrate those aspects into the project. So um, that's just uh, a little bit of a, a background on what we hope to expect you know, out of this process. And hopefully we can answer any questions or comments or concerns or um, you know, anything else that may come up uh, through the presentation. Uh, Michael, I don't know if you have any other words to suggest as well before we get into the project. No, I would just echo the, uh, the appreciation for your time and interest. Um, as Brandon said, we are Cleveland. I'm Cleveland based. Uh, Geis is, uh, has a couple offices in the Cleveland area, um, but have been engaged in a number of projects with the Geis companies. Uh, I'm a long term hold a developer and holder of real estate. So uh, and I'm hoping this is not my first venture in the Columbus market with my partners. Um, so we're excited for this opportunity, excited to share it with you and and uh, looking forward to your feedback and and you know working collaborative collaboratively on this. So thank you. Uh, Michael and Brandon, could you guys give our residents maybe some background of like how you guys came about with this project and and where it started? Yeah, sure, I can I can take that. So um, I have been you know interested in the Columbus market for um, you know a little while and was presented over the last probably 12 months with or looked at 
you know, probably a dozen opportunities and um, came across this one and, and, and struck up a relationship with the current owner. Um, it was Kevin Likens of the Likens Companies and, um, you know, put together a an arrangement to purchase the land. And so that occurred um, late summer, early fall of last year. And I've been working now with the Geist Companies on a design build basis, as we've done now for a few projects in you know, the Cleveland area and, and now this. But that, that's how it came together. And from what I understand from our last informal meeting, um, though Michael is not directly involved, I think you guys said that he is still somewhat still committed or interested in this in this development. Uh, sorry, Kevin, you mean? Uh, I'm sorry, did I? Uh, Kevin, like you, <laughs> you said, Michael, and I was like, I, I'm, I'm still involved. Um, no, Ke Kevin Likens is not an active, will not be an active owner, um, but we have been working very collaboratively on the um, the site plan, the layout, the design um, that ultimately received his approval as well. So he's obviously very um, active and invested in the neighborhood, and he's very interested to see that this is complementary to um, you know all the efforts that he's put forth and a lot of others, and you know the great neighborhood that's already there. So yeah, Kevin's been a very collaborative partner as well. Okay. Go ahead, go ahead Brandon. That's all I had. Yep. Thank you. So uh, yeah, so as Michael mentioned, he's a, a long-term holder on on almost all of his projects, and and again, that's where we had stated to the organization, the group, that to us, it's not just about uh, getting through a design phase, it's not uh, just getting through the construction phase, but it's also how the building operates, how uh, how it, it, it the vitality of the project through through the life cycle of the building uh, is maintained because um, the project's important from start to finish, not just uh, from start till uh, C of O. So um, we want to make sure that uh, we leave uh, this area and this neighborhood after construction, hopefully uh, better than when it currently is as a state today. Um, so I just wanted to kind of set the stage with that before and I'll share my screen to be able to go through um, the project itself. So uh, obviously the project's located in the Wineland Park uh, neighborhood. Um, the project is is located at the corner of East Fifth Avenue and North Fourth Street, um, and it's uh, two separate parcels uh, that are um, broken up by uh, the Sixth Avenue Alley or Sixth Street Alley. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of great growth and development that's going on in the area and in the neighborhood uh, with the fourth and fifth development that's uh, across the street under construction. And then cross line phase <laughs> one, uh, which is built and occupied um, with the potential of uh, expansion to phase two um, in direct uh, proximity and, and direct relationship to to our site. Um, just showcasing some of the developments that have been, you know, done in the area um, and nearby of similar uh, size and scale. So cross line fourth and fifth, the the beaker and um, cross line phase two. Um, as architects, as planners, as as designers, we we always like to set framework up, um, try to establish uh, what's our goal and design and and what's our goal and. Um, how we're going to deliver this project. Um, one of the things that we felt looking at uh, the relative context of adjacent developments along with um, our development itself is trying to create a vibrant street, a walkable street, an interactive street, uh, and streetscape. And while this presentation at the moment at this early stage hasn't fully um, vetted or provided details yet on those conditions, the walk-up units uh, along um, Fifth, uh, the retail spaces along 4th and 5th and, and that interaction uh, at the street level um, as we progress on design and as we uh, start to hone in um, on just uh, call it a detailed massing and, and detailed scheme, we start really focusing in on how that uh, how the building interacts the street level. These images kind of hopefully fill the gap of an idea of how um, those um, details and, and some of those interactions may occur. Um, you can see in the bottom right imagery just the, the heavy, heavy brick 
detailing and uh, the ground floor that set up a, a kind of a retail base structure and how those uh, retail um, storefronts and, and interactions can can start to um, create a, a lively streetscape. And then obviously some um, mixed materiality. Um, we try to integrate uh, our projects by breaking up, uh, I'll call it larger facades with with a mixture of texture, a mixture of materiality, a mixture of uh, design scheme. Um, so that uh, you create kind of an urban fabric and, and context in the neighborhood. Um, the middle picture of the brick detailing uh, is something that um, we think would be very uh, integral into this project with really emphasizing, uh, um, I'll call it a more historic brick approach with a modern um, modern flair um, with some expressed uh, 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 reveals um, in that brick uh, stacking. Uh, to create some texture on that building and in and, and the in the brick field. And then uh, some of the segmented metal panel uh, in some of the other pictures that show kind of a vertical um, reveal and vertical pattern uh, to create some unique interest uh, in the building um, as, as you design. So the overall project, um, as mentioned, we uh, are lining basically Fifth Avenue and, and 4th Street. Um, the building would be um, two uh development buildings that would be connected via an aerial bridge um, that aerial bridge would be um, from floors uh, three through seven um, the structure will be a seven-story structure um, and basically sets itself up on as a u shape on the upper portion uh, above the podium um, of the floor um, basically the ground floor and the second floor would have this l shape on the left parcel and then on the lower two floors, you would have this uh, more square parcel um, form. And then as you get above to the third floor and to the seventh floor, you would have a bookend match at this L shape or backwards L shape but, um, on, on the other side of, of this. Um, the project would have 186 units. Um, their market rate size, um, about 25% would be studios, 42% would be one bedrooms, and 32% would be two bedrooms. Um, we also have a generous amount of retail and restaurant space, about 4,600 square feet um, in total. And then obviously a, 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 a lobby ground floor entrance area. And then uh, there'll be six walk-up units um, on the ground floor of the building that would interact with the street. While we haven't fully designed the streetscape, you can kind of see the walk-up sidewalks that would enter the unit. We have to just coordinate some of the entryways and, and how that interacts as we're still working through floor pro plan programs, et cetera. Um, but the intent would be to create that, that type of opportunity. Um, one of the things that we're really generously respecting is, is frontage um, and setback. Um, you can kind of see um, the generous amount of space on the Fifth Street Avenue side. Um, that we're staying back from the existing curb line, along with the 4th Street Avenue side, 4th um, uh, Street side, so that we can ensure that we have the ability to create some of that outdoor streetscape um, between landscape plantings, uh, potential outdoor patios, and other lively streetscape furniture amenities, et cetera, that can align this street and create some vibrant life, um, you know, in the urban context. Um, additionally, um, one of the items that we'll be looking at doing is widening um, 6th uh, Avenue uh, to ensure that we maintain a 20 foot um, street. Right now, it's actually, I think, about 16 feet, maybe 18 feet at best, but it does kind of move back and forth. And so one of the items that will be done in this project is to widen that um, on the rear and to the side to allow and ensure that um, service vehicles uh, can can also make the turn down 6th Street easily, uh, ensuring we have a 28 foot radius, which is kind of a requirement for garbage trucks and service vehicles and fire trucks to be able to make that turn and sweep in a continuous pattern without having to back up and or jump a curb, et cetera. Um, so that's one of the elements of this project would be to um, to widen that and then also again allow for some sidewalk uh, connectivity uh, along that rear um, to set that building back as well. So we go up the building again, the second floor is a, a stack uh, above the first floor. So the, the left building has a, a, the same footprint on all seven floors um, with some surface parking on the rear. And then the lower two floors of the right parcel uh, would be a two-story parking garage. And then above that would be um, that U-shaped connected building um, on floors three through seven. Um, 
As we look through some height and context, again, um, as you look down the right of ways and look down a cross section of the street, um, the three two adjacent developments, uh, our project, while it's seven stories, it'll only be 84 feet high, um, which is the exact same height configuration as cross line phase one. So we'd be matching the same height, even though we would have an additional floor um, uh, floor level. Um, and then fourth and fifth is 66 feet. So uh, relatively one floor um, height difference between between that and uh, from a height foot percentage. Um, and as I said, some preliminary renderings. Again, these are very um, early stage renderings. However, some of the uh, elements we can kind of talk about, about the interaction of the design and how the fabric's treated. The idea is to really break up this facade, even though it's, they're, they're larger buildings, by creating um, different um, elements vertically, uh, while also breaking the context of, of those gestures. So the idea really is to kind of have a more historic feeling ground floor and base the building that, that has some hierarchy. Um, and then having some reliefs of a kind of a modern metal um, opportunity with some really nice detailing around the windows with an extruded frame uh, that will project out some of the detailing around the corners. Um, really trying to emphasize this really significant corner of the building with a, a two story storefront feel, um, even though the second floor would be a really nice uh, uh, apartment unit, the ground floor retail interacting that. Uh, the sign is obviously a very much a placeholder, but we feel that this corner really does have an opportunity for a unique, um, unique opportunity for branding and also just for attention and 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 gravitating kind of in connecting the two major streets. Um, so while it's a placeholder, the 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 apartment building obviously hasn't been named yet, um, but uh, just a placeholder for now. And then at the floor lines where we're in the metal the metal panel, the segmented textured metal panel, um, some uh, I'll call it C channel reveals. Uh, that'll happen to kind of create some uh, reveal and relief in the facade uh, and break up um, the height and, and vernacular of the architecture. Here's a view back down towards the corner at 4th and 5th. Here's a view back. Obviously, uh, we kind of uh, hit, hit the 4th and 5th development, but just to give you kind of an idea of context. A view at the corner looking back at 4th and 5th. That's just kind of general. And we have some scale drawings and stuff if anybody wanted to get into understanding some setbacks. But happy to open the table to some questions and and um, listen to, to the community's uh, reaction. Looks like we have a question from uh, Ben. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, thanks for going through all of this. Um, I guess I currently live like right off of Sixth, they're off of Hamlet. And so mm -hmm. my biggest concern right now when looking at these renderings, there doesn't appear to be any access off of Fifth anymore. And so that's a little concerning um, for the amount of traffic that's gonna be coming in off of Fourth that we no longer have an access road or anything coming off of Fifth. And so I would ask that that might be looked at again against the back end of the building and where that comes in. And then the other part is the corner of 6th in the back. Um, you were talking about the clearance for dump trucks and everything in there. There is uh, two to three homes on that corner that require cars to like back out onto that road. And so I just ask that that gets taken into consideration because the amount of traffic that's coming through there the way those houses are set up with the garages, they either have to back into their garage off of the road or they have to back out of the garage onto the road. So that is a little bit of a safety concern. And then yeah, so, that's it. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, just to respond to some of those items, um, there, there currently isn't a, a public street or connection uh, to fifth off of six. It, it, it's simply been kind of, I'll call it a existing condition that people have taken advantage of. Um, because it's a demoed parking lot at the moment um, and understand that people are using it as a, as a cross access, um, but it's it's not like it's a dedicated city street or right away um, to, to allow for that. Um, so uh, we'll get in conversations with our client and talk about potentials there. Um, but I know that one of the items that you know we are doing is we are widening 6th Avenue currently, as I said, I, I believe it's 18 feet wide 
currently, um, which does make uh, it almost impossible to back out of those houses uh, in configurations. And I'm sure as they do, they probably back up onto um, what would be the property um, as well. So one of the items, as we said, we're, we're definitely widening that road. Um, that road will be widened solely on our side of the street. Um, so that will be done to create a 20 foot wide um, from edge of pavement to edge of pavement uh, to allow for access into and maneuverability out of um, those garages and, and to those access ways. Um, so hopefully that will definitely suffice. And then additionally, we will be, you know, we are pulling that building back off of that property line. Um, I believe we're holding that off about at least eight feet. I think it's 10 feet uh, from the edge of what will be the new property line because uh, we are actually giving back right away uh, to the city to uh, ensure that uh, curb to curb is property line or right away property, not privatized in um, that fashion. Uh, next I have is from Martin family. Um, do you guys want to go ahead? Thank you, guys. Yep. Uh, so, hi, this is Michael Wilkos. I'm actually visiting the Martins. Um, and just uh, reacting to the project, I'm fine with height, I'm fine with density, but I feel like when I look at the fourth and fifth project, I personally will admit that I think I was one of those votes that are, that said yes to fourth and fifth, but um, didn't really have the opportunity to sit back and look at the scale of that project. And I think fourth and fifth is rather overwhelming on the street. And so as you were walking through, Brandon, the uh, design, I personally don't think the building is broken up enough. Like I appreciate the setbacks, which I think really helped to break up the massing. I think this, um, constant use of the dark gray. I mean, we've got cross line, the one going up on 7th Avenue, like this use of the dark gray over and over just really makes for a bland neighborhood. And so particularly given how many other gray buildings are popping up, I would like for you to consider using a variation of colors or to brighten that building up because to be brutally honest, the building right now looks like a giant box that take off the sign Wineland. It could be a hospital. It could be a student dorm. It says nothing to me about the neighborhood architecturally, and I think it's just a big bland box. But if you would break those two structures up so they look like two totally different buildings or brighten one of those blocks up, I think it would go a long way to improve the streetscape for what already appears to be a lot of what are really large buildings that feel out of scale of the neighborhood. And I feel that this building is presently designed, uh, perpetuates that out of scale feeling, but I think you could get this size of a project in with better architecture. That's my thoughts. Yeah, th thanks Brandon for the presentation. Um, I think my what I would add to Michael's comments on the, the architecture and just the kind of boxiness and blandness of of the of the architecture is is uh, traffic flow on the block mm -hmm. um, and and parking, which we'll we'll come back to. But the, the traffic flow on this block uh, is challenging because it's between two one ways. It's essentially a a dead end, narrow one way street, and functions almost only in that reality because of the access that that lot currently provides. And don't get me wrong, I think building on it makes sense. We don't want an eyesore that's underutilized and building housing makes sense because our city and our region need more of it. Uh, but as you said, you know, the, the you know, access to Fifth Avenue that won't exist with this anymore, you know, part of what has made that possible uh, you know, is the the alley that used to exist where those houses now exist. So there was once an alley that created some circulation through. Um, that easement was sold off and developed some years ago. Again, like we got new neighbors like Ben, which is great, uh, but it limits 
it limits the flow of traffic on a really tight street. And I'll give you an example of something that happens on this block and on this street pretty pretty with with some regularity is if you've got a car going south on Hamlet and you've got a car turning north onto the street from Fifth Avenue and God forbid a car coming out of the alley from Fourth Street, you have three cars that are like, you know, ready to run into each other that literally have nowhere to go. That's the type of block it is. And so not only limiting traffic flow on a block like that, but pouring this, this much more traffic onto it, just it really exacerbates a, a grid lot that we all kind of have learned to live with uh, in the current context. So th that's obviously a big concern and appreciate the widening of the alley, but the flow is a major concern. And then with respect to parking, you know, what, you, what you're showing right there is, is a great a uh, picture of some of what's uh, underway or has recently been built. But what you're not highlighting is properties there along North 4th, uh, just south of 5th Avenue. Um, obviously, what's been built uh, in the recent years on the Grant Park development, and then what's under construction also on the south side of 5th Avenue right there with Lycans, they're actually over a thousand units under construction on this corridor right here right now all of which have some degree of parking variances uh, and so we don't even know yet what that is going to look like and so under parking a building like this on top of all of those it, it adds to and exacerbates a problem that we're not even we don't even know the scale of yet because of all those units coming online mm -hmm. and just for context like a thousand units is almost the population of the eastern half of the the Wineland Park neighborhood. That's almost that's almost the number of households of Census Tract 16. So, adding that while while uh, continuing to underpark it just it exacerbates good. it exacerbates a problem that. You know. So let me uh, let me interrupt and interject for one second, um, and and appreciate uh, that comment and, and, and feedback. And we are definitely trying to be respectful and understanding of you know the impact of a development like this. But I do want to stress the fact that this project is parked to parking code. We are not asking for a variance for parking, unlike a lot of these other projects. So I do want to stress the fact that we are parking compliant with the city's parking standard. Um, and we strongly feel that that parking standard is appropriate for development like this to not create a parking problem um, within its own development. Um, so uh, just wanted to stress that um, Michael holds a lot of properties that are a one to one um, parking ratio and they're under par they, they aren't fully utilized. Um, parking is um, not fully utilized and there's a handful of reasons for that. One of the items for multifamily projects is, is there isn't a constant flow of traffic. It's not like an office um, that has a everyone's in by nine and everyone's out by five and there's a huge flow of traffic. Traffic comes in and out of a multifamily project diluted um, and, and at various times throughout the day. So from a traffic engineering society perspective, it's actually um, uh, representational um a, of a lot less of a demand on on traffic uh than than other uses could be on a site like this um the international uh, engineer society's uh parking ratio for an urban environment like this is actually 0.93 um uh spaces parking spaces per unit um is actually uh what what their urban standard is for for a national transportation engineer society's standard um so we are well above that but I do understand that there is a parking demand and there has been um, a lot of projects that have gone through a variance process for that. And that was one of the items that we absolutely would, would not consider uh, was going with a project that would require and demand a parking variance because uh, we just don't think that that's a good business decision. Just to follow up uh, to that line of questioning, um, what is your plan for traffic flow as it impacts Hamlet Street and flows back around to the proposed site behind on on 6th Street? Because right now Hamlet is 
officially a two way street functions basically as a one way street. Um, and because of the route that the trash trucks have to go, I believe it has to stay a two way street. Um, but with the size of the street, it cannot handle two way traffic. This is going to really increase traffic up and down our street and we got to have some sort of plan of how to deal with that. Traffic is already not great on the street and it's a thoroughfare to a city park and an elementary school and between two, two daycares. Um, so having tons of traffic that's going two ways and head on collisions is going to be bad both for vehicle safety and pedestrian safety. And I guess a quick question on that before before you answer, Brandon, is will all of the resident parking uh, go in and out from North 4th Street or or is there a. Like, is, the, is it likely that there will be traffic on Hamlet Street for residents of the property? I might be completely misunderstanding this, but I, I don't believe any of our traffic will be heading on Hamlet Street. Um, our, our traffic will be maintained on 6th Avenue and coming out, out on the 4th Street. Get there, Brandon, there, would you mind um, switching to no, one of the slides that shows the parking garage? And but so yeah. this is going to be between this. Perfect. Yeah. And, I, and in I between those two I, buildings are East Sixth uh, Avenue, correct? Correct. So all of and our traffic will be, will be will be basically on Sixth Sixth Avenue, um, and 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 on Fourth Street. Um, there, there there's full row of houses and developments that that would separate us uh, from. Not we wouldn't even be able to get access to Hamlet. So uh, unless I'm completely uh, misspoken on this, I I don't think that that. Well, Sixth Avenue goes around, goes along the park, so it's east west uh, for a little bit, and then use around to Hamlet. So if it's, someone it's, is wanting to access your development from Fifth Avenue, a lot of the traffic will be coming Fifth Avenue up Hamlet and around the back way along the park, then south down Sixth Avenue and around. So with that many cool. units, with 200 some units, there's or 200 some bedrooms there's no way that there's not going to be an impact on traffic flow on hamlet street yeah that that alley is it is the end of hamlet street that's where hamlet flows to and i mean you can say okay yeah they're going to enter from fourth street but if they're i promise you because i've lived here 15 years and i watch it every day if they're coming east on fifth avenue and it's a red light at fourth and fifth they're going to turn left on the Hamlet to get into the garage. <laughs> and that's going to happen a lot more often with this many people with, in there. With, and I, I just Brandon. want to talk on that just real fast. I, I'm, the, for me, the concern is actually the opposite direction because I think you're going to have a lot more people leave sixth and go around Hamlet to get to fifth because people don't want to go down fourth as a one way. Yeah, it only well, lets my, right. my personal concern. It's not so much people turning off a fifth on the Hamlet and around because that's how it operates today. But I think it's going to people leave the garage down sixth up to Hamlet and get on fifth to hit summit because mm -hmm. people don't want to get on fourth and go we'll north definitely. to go south. Yeah, so they'll but definitely. That's, that, that's and, that's, definitely and that's because there's no space for Fifth Avenue exit between that daycare and right. the yeah. a front building. Yeah, and, and that's why I was saying if we had an access road off of Fifth, mm -hmm. I know you. I know it doesn't exist today because it's a parking lot. But if there was a one-way access road out even to Fifth, that would be a benefit because that that's how I would view it. Because I I do have the concern so, of the around Ben it, it is my understanding from the city there is a lot of concern about I'll call it curb cuts uh, along this area um, oh, yeah. and, and yeah. if I go back to that to this slide it's because there are a lot of different um, streets that interconnect into fifth you know allowing it and that a uh, I'll call it a rear drive sneaking it behind fifth at you know behind the development or even if we were to give an access off of fifth avenue um, there's no way that the city would allow us a curb cut on fifth in that close proximity to an intersection that's on a, a, a call offset, you know, it, it's on an offset grid. It's not a 90 degree intersection. Um, there is a traffic signal um, 
um, project and improvement uh, for this area um, that is underway. Um, and again, that was one of the reasons we're staying away um, from the frontages uh, to ensure we allow for you know potential future growth and, and future expansion um, of the right of way of the streets. At the end of the day, uh, we're trying to accommodate everything we can for the future, I'll call it provisions and um, expansions and, and adjustments in the right of way. Um, uh, you know, at one time there was some discussion about potentially widening Fifth Avenue, but the problem is, is there's now four new developments that prevent that widening because uh, their uh, facade is, uh, you know, encroaching on the right away more than, you know, more than we even are. Uh, we we could potentially allow for a turn turn lane expansion or a lane expansion or even a parking expansion um, on our side. Unfortunately, the the new developments on Fourth and Fifth and Cross Line. Um, you know, hinder anything more than it literally just being for, I'll call it a quarter of a block. So anything more than a, a turning uh, lane uh, is going to be hard to, you know, compete because of existing facades and storefronts and, and, and buildings. Um, but I, I'm, we're happy to look at uh, the, the flow of traffic and, and look at the studies of, of flow and traffic and seeing how uh, they would interact. Um, I, the reality is, is I don't think this development um, is changing any of the dynamic of how the condition is today, other than potentially, let's just say, adding 200 more cars uh, in that process. Um, but I will say this, 200 cars is is not a considerable amount of traffic by when it comes to city urban uh, streetscape and, and street flow patterns. Um, that doesn't necessarily, that that type of traffic impact doesn't necessarily change a grade of service uh, or impact the save a, a, a grade of service uh, on a street. Thousand cars per day, you know, have impact. Uh, um, hundreds, you know, a couple hundred does does not. Um, and I say that from a perspective of understanding and evaluating traffic engineering reports on multiple developments and projects uh, across the country. But again, we're happy to take a look at it and see how we can maybe help alleviate some issues and 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 try to work through this because we don't want to create a, you know, a traffic nightmare. And in the end of the day, uh, these are for rent units. If it's impossible to get into the garage for the parking, what residents are going to rent an apartment here if they can't access you know, the building? I know Brandon at um, we do we'll go to Laura's question here um, here in a second. She has had her hand up for a while. The um, the Beaker property actually does have two different garages where they do have a in and out from fifth. I think one of their one of their um, garages is for tenants only, and then their other garage that faces Summit um, is for I think guests only. So I wonder if you guys could work with the city, if there could be some sort of maybe a right hand only fake uh, for traffic exiting and, and going westward only on Fifth Avenue, if that was potentially a uh, an option. Otherwise, if people do want to travel southbound, they're certainly may not going to use uh, the East 6th Avenue corridor to go up 4th to 7th. I would imagine they're going to see more traffic going into East 6th um, through there to go southbound. Um, Laura, do you want to go ahead and uh, ask your question? And I believe you first are I'll have to unmute good. myself. Yes, um, spend long enough on mute. Um, I I was really glad to see an increased setback on both sides of the project from the sidewalk, because the thing I really would like to ask about and ask uh, the developers to think about is the nature of the street trees and what kind of provision can be made to have healthy and um, eventually mature trees along the sides of the building. Um, I think we've seen as Columbus experimented with zero setback plans for a long time, we see trees get put in and then struggle and kind of die. And as you drive the rest of the way up North 4th Street, you see what it's like to have 
really beautiful mature trees on either side of the street. And it's something that could be reintroduced to this lower section of Fourth Street, uh, given enough care to creating enough soil space to put real trees in there. Does that seem like something that y'all could think about? Um, not necessarily along Fifth and North Fourth, but um, perhaps especially along North Fourth. Uh, it's our it's our intention to heavily uh, landscape and and create a, a wonderful tree, street experience along both uh, streetscapes. Um, you know uh, that element. Um, we don't want to be a sea of part uh, of concrete. Um, there'll be foundation plantings along the building. The intent would be to have a, kind of a stoop entry at the, the units that walk up there. Um, the ability to have outdoor patio space for a potential retail or coffee shop or restaurant area. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, very much add uh, street trees to uh, to the fold here um, and, and provision to ensure that they can grow appropriately. Um, there's different tree species that can grow vertically and not have as large of, um, uh, you know, a, a round canopy uh, that would impede uh, into the building. Um, there's also slow growth trees. So we, we usually try to work with a, a mixture of, I'll call it lower height uh, trees, and then also kind of more appropriate uh, heavier scale trees that would, you know, mature and, and grow um, and, you know, with, with that area and city. Um, we're very much aware of this from being in from Cleveland, who's always considered the four city. Uh, it's been a huge, um, huge push by our planning and city departments um, to ensure that we maintain street trees and in, in, and they have a tree preservation plan along with a, a street tree program that needs to be installed with all their developments. So we would be utilizing very similar principles um, in this project as well that we use and maintain in, in, in our other markets. I would really love to see that and look forward to hearing more. Um, maybe my follow up question is, could you tell us what what is the process that you anticipate going through um, with the city and with the neighborhood area commission? Like what kind of what are you requesting zoning variances? Are you going to the university area commission? You know, what's the logistics for that coming up? Um, we have a handful of meetings um, that we still need to go through. Uh, we've been through the process, I'll call it in, in one wave. Uh, at the moment, we have to go back for the second wave uh, of that process, which would be going uh, to the University Area Commission's um, committee and then to the full commission. And then uh, if all goes well there, then we do have to go um, through um, the BZA process. Um, while we are not asking for a variance on parking, we are asking for an variance, a variance on density um, and height um, that are all uh, able to be approved um, by uh, those commissions. Am I correct that you're not um, in the purview of the University Area Impact Review Board? I believe that is correct. Ben, do you know offhand? I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, our, our next question comes from uh, Kelly. Go ahead. Um, thank you for wanting to invest in the neighborhood. That corner has been an eyesore for a while and I'm looking forward to seeing something there. I'm also glad to hear what Laura mentioned that there will be some good landscaping elements. Um, I do wanna echo whoever brought up the facade um, I would also appreciate seeing some variation between the two structures because what's happening across the street at 4th and 5th is just so looming. It, I feel like it will change the character of the neighborhood to have these two very large, very similar structures across the street from each other. Um, so I, I, I would appreciate seeing some, some variation, these boxy structures that we're seeing all around the short north area in the villages right now is, in my opinion, I'm sorry, it's getting tired. So I would appreciate seeing no. some variation. And, and I appreciate and respect both of those comments uh, made by yourself and, and also the Martins. I think at this stage, I, I do want to stress we are at a, what I would consider a preliminary or conceptual perspective on the design. Uh, we haven't gotten into um, elaborating on, on that facade. Um, it's more of an applied massing that has materiality applied to it. 
Um, okay. Window reliefs and other aspects will be what we'll be starting to look at as we progress and, and design. Um, through that, um, being able to, you know, uh, work through some of the detail and depth and reliefs of windows, uh, grouping and pairings, um, and and then I, we absolutely can take a look at potentially breaking up the materiality so that it doesn't look as cohesive. We felt that it was a little bit more um, appropriate being uh, more cohesive and tied together, but um, we absolutely can. We'll take a look and explore uh, that. Hearing you know two comments uh, about that. Um, I will stress on the fourth and fifth size and, and aspect, while they aren't as tall as us, they are almost twice the length of us, um, and they are a, a, a facade that does not necessarily break itself up as much. Um, so I, I do want to stress the fact that uh, I do understand that looming, that presence along uh, fourth street of that development. Um, we're only uh, maybe a little under two thirds um, of the length of it. And obviously we'll have that relief and break um, of six. I know they have kind of a relief and break back to their parking, but it's really on a almost the same alignment um, there. But uh, we'll definitely take a look at that and see how we can kind of interject and adjust to, to accommodate those requests. I, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I did have a direct question about how many parking spaces will be since you have retail planned how many parking spaces will be for the general public and not tenants so in any commingled uh uh de development that has you know multi-use or mixed use uh there is a, a kind of i'll call it a, a shared parking configuration that you know there's different types of parking demands different times of demands obviously a restaurant may have more of a demand in the morning or lunch or evening hours depending on what that you know what that that area is versus i'll call it a, a clothing store or something else that's uh, of that nature that may have hours from 8 to 8 p.m or so uh that may not uh you know uh you know respect that same uh aspect um i believe we're parked um per city code which is uh, uh one per 300 square feet uh for the retail area um i'll double check those numbers it's, i can't remember offhand if it's one per 300 or one per 400 um but uh we we would always we'd have that kind of parking allotment uh for the retail spaces so how many square feet is it the retail space uh, it's 45, 4,600 square feet. Okay. So a dozen or so parking spaces. Yeah, and I think the intent obviously would be that, uh, you know, just a natural break, you know, the 12 spaces that are surfaced would probably be utilized more for the public. You know, the, the parking garage structure itself would probably be more, ten, you know, tended to be used for the residents, but that's just subjective. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's how it'll it'll work out. Okay, and then my my reason for asking about parking is we have i mean just down the street you've got them on your map we have the aubrey and the beaker that both of their retail spaces are sitting vacant right now and that's not good for our neighborhood so if it, there's going to be retail there needs to be a way for people to access that so do you guys have a plan for and I, this may be way too preliminary but do you have plans to solicit a tenant is there someone already interested i just i would hate to see another corner building with a corner vacancy yeah this, um, i'm sure michael yeah michael answer this question but I yeah know a... sure sure <laughs> um I, I will be the yeah i appreciate that question uh probably more than you might know because retail in an urban setting can be a challenge and i appreciate that there's some thoughtfulness to that question, as I can tell, because I think that there's been some instances, um, at least in some projects in Cleveland, where it's like, you, you have a first floor, you need retail, you need retail, you need retail. And, and I, while I appreciate that from an urban design um, and planning standpoint, the reality is that it, you know, it's a very challenged sector. And so we were um, very deliberate in providing what we think is a reasonable amount of retail for the scale of this project in this neighborhood. Um, direct answer to your question is that, you know, we are still two years out from delivering this, um, which is um, pretty early on relative to soliciting, attracting, you know, true business proposals for a space like this. Um, but shortly after we would get 
started and actually have a opening date that would be a little more firm, we would engage, you know, typically a broker that would, you know, solicit what we identify as the best uses for the area. And we would welcome the feedback on the community for that because um, this is your community. Uh, we're obviously going to be long term uh, holders and neighbors, but um, would certainly welcome the input on that um, because I, we, I couldn't agree with you more. Nobody likes to see a, a ground floor that's that's empty for a long time. If you're seeking input on what that should be, I speak for my household, including my husband, that we would love to see some sort of like bodega or market, something that's sure. useful to the community rather than necessarily another restaurant space. I, yeah. You're wrong. I love our restaurants, but I'd like to see something that's actually useful. So it maybe has some longevity. Sure. And yeah. that's all the questions and comments I have. So thank you. Yeah. No, I absolutely appreciate that. Thank you. All right, uh, next we'll go to Lauren. Um, go ahead and ask your question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, and I just want to echo two statements that um, earlier speakers have made. First, Kelly, totally with you. It would be so great to have a grocery store. <laughs> I know grocery stores don't make money, but that would solve a lot of these problems, the traffic problems. That would be that would make it wonderful to live here and that would make it wonderful place for your tenants to live and it would make it truly an urban space which is somehow that's that, that does not seem to be what's happening with all this development that people are still driving their cars everywhere and it's just not sustainable um the other comment i just wanted to echo was a comment from the martins earlier about the traffic flow um, Brandon, I appreciate your um, your expertise, uh, but I find it really hard to believe given our practical experience with the traffic patterns on Hamlet Street and the alley that adding 200 people living in that building is not gonna affect things. Um, I would be happy to kind of take you on a drive around the neighborhood and give you a sense of how the, the traffic patterns work for us who live here um, so that you can really, you know, apply your expertise to come up with some creative solutions for how we can all live together without kind of endangering uh, the, the drivers and the pedestrians that, that do use our area. Um, because it is a very unique traffic situation, um, as the Martins were describing. It's essentially a one-way street that allows two-way traffic, and I think that's going to cause a lot of issues as we add more people on the back side because people are going to be using Hamlet to access the, the units. Um, so, you know, just would really love the opportunity to engage with you all to come up with some creative ways to, with, that we can minimize um, any kind of safety issues that come up with these new units. Um, I can really appreciate that, Lauren, um, and absolutely. Um, and again, as I mentioned, this onset of this call, um, those types of comments um, I respect very much um, because I, we we aren't residents in this area. Um, so bringing this to our attention allows us to kind of take a very close look at it and a better understanding um, so that we can, you know, try to ensure that we aren't creating uh, a problem we you know we again we want to live in this community um and when i say live i mean this building operate and flow and and, and work within the community again as Mike, i said michael is uh, his company uh self-manages these properties so if we create uh traffic problems or traffic nightmares they're not going to lease which then creates a major problem for this development um, and you can laugh or, or look at it as a wrong way, but the reality is, is we want to make sure that we seamlessly integrate into the neighborhood um, and, and enhance it. So um, I will be in Columbus here in the in the almost immediate near future um, and definitely try to take a look at that at, uh, I'll call it multiple times during the day um, because traffic is an of evolution um, and it has different impacts from morning to evening to afternoon um and even to non you know not peak hours so understanding that and seeing that is is crucial um at the same time uh there we can only do so much obviously with within our site um so there is going to be a need to you know look at of how maybe there might be some opportunities um to alleviate or or, or um address 
um, you know, some of those situations. So, um, you know, one of the items that currently exists, uh, there, there's kind of a drive that's partially utilizing half of our property and half of their property, but there's no easements currently for um, right on the property's edge. Um, so, um, not saying that looping around the building is going to give us that great of an opportunity, but it, it appears to me as an outsider that the two parcels that are directly adjacent to us utilize um, kind of I'll call it a shared drive that doesn't really exist um, to access their properties. So maybe there might be a creative way that we can create uh, the opportunity and the setback off of this side um, to maybe maybe create a relief um, point where flow can maybe get you know back to forth. And I understand that forth you know uh, is one way and that still puts you in some pattern that gets you, you know, gets you to the, to the east and west here. But, um, um, but it, those are things that we can take a look at and see how we can maybe help uh, better the situation. Brandon, we still have a few questions. Do you mind if, are you able to extend maybe perhaps another 15 minutes so we can go through another couple no, questions? Or? Yeah, no. Not at all. And, and again, I, I will say that um, I don't have a problem, uh, Chris, if you want to share my contact information. Again, we, we really want to be a part of this community, about a part of this neighborhood. We 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 strive, you know, pride ourselves on listening and working through not just through design and development, but also through construction. Um, one of the elements that I will say, we, we are the contractor for this project for Michael. Um, so when it comes to um, how we're going to build this building and potential, I'll say, temporary lane closures or temporary uh, a flow of traffic uh, because we're doing a, a utility tie-in or other aspects. We want to make sure we're available to you guys and communicating to you guys so that we aren't disrupting your everyday. Uh, as Michael alludes to, this project is a big project, so it will take about two years to, to build and construct. And what I don't want to see and what we always stress to the, the neighbors and residents that we build in communities with is we do not want to... Um, put a strain in your life for that that period where you, you want to just hate, you hate us. Um, we, we I want you to be able to call us and say, hey, I, I have this problem. I, I, I'll give an example of another project we did with Michael uh, in the Cleveland market. Uh, we had a big, big windstorm um, and our uh, our fence blew over um, and, and was blocking a drive. Our, our superintendent uh, got to the site on a Saturday morning within 15 minutes of um, uh, getting contacted that that happened and and we're able to 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 you know not disrupt the tenant and that's we str we pride ourselves on that um you know we've been in business for 56 years as a, a design build construction company and uh we want to make sure that uh we leave that type of reputation um that's our best marketing piece for future work etc so again um I'm happy to take an extra 15, 20, 30 minutes, or if someone wants to reach out to me offline, um, maybe you're not really a huge person that likes to talk in a public setting. Um, unfortunately, I have to do it too often, um, but uh, please feel free to reach out, email us, um, and we'll see what we can do to accommodate. So I, I, I will say I really do appreciate the um, traffic flow discussion. Um, it definitely opens our eyes to those types of discussions, and it's something we'll try to address in the future. Uh, adjusting architecture, adjusting flow and traffic, uh, those types of things are easy to try to integrate. Street trees, um, you know, uh, those are things that uh, we, we pride ourselves to try to work with the community on. Thanks. I appreciate you uh, extending uh, the Martins. Do you, have, do you guys have another question? Yeah, I just wanted to verify. No. You said that on the north edge of the development, you guys are considering or maybe going to keep that access to 4th Street or no? Or is that still up in the air? I, I'm just saying that at the moment, uh, there is no easement there. Um, and uh, it appears that they're utilizing kind of uh, part of our property for access. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would have to be a mutual agreement between the adjacent property owner and our development um, to potentially kind of create that shared drive down the split center of an easement. But there might be an opportunity that maybe there is an ability to create a one way, you know, 16 foot wide relief point, um, you know, around that that wouldn't impede or uh, uh, prevent um, the development. Um, you know, the way that it's laid out currently to accommodate. So that's something that we're happy to kind of look at and see, and it may be able to relieve some of the stress and impact 
um, you know, on the neighborhood and and how that works through. We'll take a look at where traffic's going, how it's going, um, and do what we do what we do uh, when we understand that there's a, a traffic flow problem for the best that we can. Um, all right, that's helpful. One more comment before Michael gets it. And this is not uh, not everyone at the Martin table here agrees, but I would just like to say that I do not want it to be seven stories. I it's five stories across the street at the fourth and fifth development. I think that that's a more appropriate scale, given that this is embedded into an existing block with um, mostly single family homes. And so my vote would be for five stories or less, please. All right, so now it's back to me. I'm going to contradict my table mate and say I would like 10 stories. So <laughs> split the difference and go seven. But we're talking about the parking. Um, in looking at the rendering that I've seen, in addition to the street trees that Laura brought up, what is missing in this rendering are some additional details um, that would be helpful as the project continues to evolve. So as an example, um, I feel like the first two floors of the building with the parking structure, that ground floor looks very clinical right now. And I would appreciate some kind of design treatment that would be special to the parking structure on the first floor. As I did the math, that's about what 120 or 130 feet of frontage. And I think just walking by 130 feet of smoked, dark windows would not be an enjoyable experience. One of the things I would also like to ask for would be pedestrian lighting on that building. Yes. One of the things I've noticed when we look at High Line at Nine or One Pearl Place, some of these other larger buildings that have been built, they fail to have any ground floor pedestrian lighting. And I appreciate you talking about two different layers of trees. It would be nice to have a tree canopy tree, a pedestrian scale tree. But if that happens, we can't rely on the overhead lights for the vehicles on 4th to illuminate the sidewalk. So I'd like to see some pedestrian scale lighting on that facade. I'd like to understand what is the experience like for me as I walk by that building. In acknowledgement with everybody else that the fourth and fifth building, it's twice as long, it's quite tall. The scale of that building at the ground level might be okay because we'll be walking by landscaping, but unless Thrive does a really nice job with landscaping those front areas, you don't have the experience of walking by someone's front door or walking by someone's porch because of the elevation change. You have less of an elevation change for your first floor here, so I'd like to see how that northern section really treats the sidewalk in a pedestrian walkable human scale, which I can't see on the renderings currently. Yeah, and um, I didn't get your name other than just through the group at the Martins, but um, I appreciate the commentary. Um, and and uh, I will say that um, usually streets uh, streetscape is kind of our, um, I don't want to say last, but our latter part of design. We try to work with massing and understanding how the interaction happens with the building at first at, at, at more of a global scale and then hone in at, at the pedestrian level. I will say and uh, promise and guarantee that there will be a fair amount of uh, exterior building lighting on this building. Um, usually we like to do it at different stages and when I mean stages at different height levels um, due to uh, trying to ensure uh, I'll call it sustainability practices. We, we will be dark sky compliant so that will we will not have up lighting on this building. It'll be down lighting on this building uh, to uh, ensure. So we typically will will light these types of structures, these seven story structures at, at multiple levels uh, to ensure we have kind of a constant beam and a constant glow. Um, and then obviously again at the grade as well. Uh, with some potential landscape bed um, and bollard light type uh, scenarios to really create a, a unique experience. Um, the smoke uh, smoke glass isn't glass at, at that parking garage level. It's actually a, a perforated screen um, uh, and, 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 and device, but we can absolutely take a look at that to try to create, um, uh, you know, maybe that's something a little bit more unique. Um, we have looked at other projects about public art, uh, an opportunity for potential murals or other aspects. Some communities don't like that approach um, because they feel that it'll turn into a graffiti field, but um, it's something that we've looked at in other projects to potentially look at to try to enhance and create a little bit more uh, human scale um, in interaction with the street. 
Um, so all these things we'll take a look at and try to address uh, as we move forward. Um, as far as timing, uh, I will say that we we are uh, looking in the next two weeks to really take all these commentary uh, and adjust and make a significant amount of changes and progress this design uh, along with develop the streetscape, et cetera. Some of that stuff we actually started ahead of this meeting uh, in anticipation of, but um, we will be coming back uh, to the to the UAC um, probably the first of the month to be able to um, showcase all these changes and adjustments um, and, and, and address these these comments, concerns and, and iterations. So thank you guys for your thoughtful comments. All right, uh, next question comes from Karina. Go ahead. Hi, so this is actually Chris Epperson, um, okay. but Karina's right here too. Um, we actually had some of the same concerns about the design of the building, um, particularly the, like that parking lot on, you know, to the north of the apartments, just the I, I walked to work, um, you know, to go with you and like, I really hate the, a lot of the buildings on high street, you'll have like the, the retail in front facing the street. Great. But then the moment you walk off the street, it's just like a sea of parking. So whether it's like the tinted, you know, kind of windows that, you know, he was mentioning earlier, or if it's just like, you know, bars and you just, you're just, it's just a parking lot. Right. And it doesn't matter that there's stuff above it. For me, walking by it is still just a parking lot, and it's not really fun to walk next to. And just thinking with this being on 4th Street, I would rather it be almost anything else other than just looking at cars. <laughs> so I don't know if you could, you know, retail space in front. Maybe you could do the walk-up apartments there lining the street instead so the parking is hidden behind it um, or some other kind of unique idea that you might have but just anything other than looking at a blank wall or looking at cars would be really great i think for just how the street feels yeah we'll take a look and see um how we might be able to activate that space um uh, the challenge always right is you know we could be in a different respect, right? Where we would ask for a variance for less parking spaces, but then we create that um, more retail space, right? Um, so uh, there's give and take. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is obviously um, comply with parking, not request a variance for parking, um, but there might be some creative ventures that we might be able to kind of shift or flip um, and see if we can maybe accommodate uh, maybe a partial facade of activation. Um, and, and make up for that parking uh, in a different area of development. So we'll we'll take a look and try to get back, you know, quickly with that and take that information back to see if we can accommodate it. I would personally be more than fine with the parking variance if it meant doing something with that street right there. So I wouldn't even mind like showing up to the zoning committee meeting or the UAC meetings just to say the alternative is just having a parking lot. <laughs> so I mean. Yeah, I, I'm personally okay with less parking, especially if it means not having a parking lot and having an actual, I don't know, actual neighbors or something to do there. So. Sure. All right, uh, our next uh, question comes from Tom. Uh, go ahead and when you're ready. All right, all right, can you hear me? All right, yes. great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, like to thank Brandon and Michael for presenting this to us all. Good evening, Hamlet neighbors. How y'all doing? Um, looking at, I, I appreciate you presenting this to us because we've all been holding our breaths to see what was going to happen with the beer barn lot. Um, and I really, I like the idea of two two buildings, two distinct buildings, and then the connecting bridge. And if you, Brandon, could you? Traffic flow is everything for us in our neighborhood. Um, we love living on the park. And many of the residents on Hamlet Street have been here for a decade or decades. Um, some people who are in their 70s most of their lives. And we really like the walkability, the ease of access to everything, um, we're, you know, from Hamlet Street. So, Brandon, if I'm looking at that L-shaped building and that access to Fifth Avenue, which we all have a concern about, um, I don't know if you can zoom in and because I would like to get some clarification on the western edge of the L-shaped building where there is a daycare center. There you go. Thank you. I see an is that an open air 12 space parking lot or 
Is Correct. That that's a, that's a okay. surface open open lot. The the left building is simply this L shape uh, extrusion. Yeah. Okay, so could it not? I think you would lose two spaces, two parking spaces, if you created a connecting from the Sixth Avenue outlet to Fifth. You know, connect that to Fifth Avenue. It would just be two parking spaces, and people could, you know, that could be a source of egress, right? The the problem isn't the the spaces. I mean, we'd figure the spaces out. The problem is the building is within. Uh, I think it's nine feet uh, to the property line, which wouldn't be enough to accommodate a, a drive access. Um, unfortunately, is um, that it, is that because there you need a variance or? I'm saying we'd have to we'd have to trim the building back, uh, probably uh, at least eight feet to accommodate a drive out. Okay. Could you get a variance from the city for that, or is that to, to, to have a eight foot wide driveway? Hey, it's better than no. <laughs> it's better than nothing, right? Yeah, I I would think that um, we would be there would be more of an opportunity potentially on the um, the right side of this parcel, given the existing conditions on the adjacent parcel. But there are some discussions that need to be had to to be able to kind of talk through it. But again, a, a, as I said, I I think. Um, it's the first we were aware of, uh, I'll call it a true <laughs> access along um, this northern edge, because um, it, it, it's a gravel lot, let's be honest, so you could kind of just cut through. Um, and then I, Well, I, we've I been know. using that. It used to not be gravel. It used to be the beer barn, and it was a paved lot until they tore okay. down the barn, and we used that for decades yeah. uh, to get to Fifth Avenue, and that's one of our major exit points to go south. Uh, if you look at Hamlet Street, where we live, it doesn't end in a cul-de-sac. It ends in a right angle. And so there, to turn around is very difficult. And looking at this, you know, I think, you know, we want to support this. We want the beer barn to be, you know, a lot to be developed and everything. Uh, and, and we, you know, it would, you gain a lot of favorability and support from the neighborhood if, we could have a good traffic flow going on because that right angle on six that you've created, I don't know. I mean, it's hard enough for the fire department, trash trucks and everyone to get through. And then you create this right angle. Well, so that, right there. that yeah. So, um, and it may be hard to see, um, but you can see this archway mm -hmm. um, here. And that is a, uh, a, a fire truck access radius. Okay. Um, which, which, if a fire truck can make that turn, a garbage truck can make the turn. Uh, fire trucks have worse uh, uh, turning radius than, than than garbage trucks, and the whole reason we basically, um, and you can see um, the existing parcel lines mm -hmm. um, and the existing right away lines, and we're actually proposing to adjust the parcel lines and give back um, about four feet on the um, north south um, plan north south um, access, and then uh, it's about three feet on the um, east west of six to ensure that from curb to curb uh, there is a right truly a right away dedication uh, of 20 feet which uh, 20 foot right. dedication of right away is basically a bare minimum for a two-way street um, by, by by city standards and urban standards yeah, so I get that. Um, we're, if, we're, if we're, we're, we're the, doing that the go ahead sorry okay if you go to the north end of your plan of your site map there you go where you were, I'm sorry, the north where you were looking at uh, working, creating another yes right there. Now, sorry. you would have to have, what would it take to make that happen? You're saying over here? Right. Um, well, it, it's been done, um, but basically it would have to be a mutually agreed easement between both properties that uh, the parcel line would go down the middle of that easement. And you'd have a shared access on half of our property, half of their property um, to potentially accommodate that. Um, I think again, that's we could, that could be done. I, I'm friends with that landlord that owns that property. And I'm sure that he would agree. I, I can't speak for him, but it would, it would seem mutually beneficial to both of you, to both parties to create that easement. Yeah, and I mean, from a, I'll call it a safety perspective, um, the, the two access points would be far enough apart um, to be more of an appropriate standard for a curb cut. Uh, again, there, there's a lot of concern about uh, a zero lot line on the daycare 
an access and turn out. I'm sure if we pull uh, accident reports, there's probably been a lot of accidents pulling out of this. Um, Not right there. Uh, most, okay. most of the accidents occur at 4th and 5th. Okay. Well, I know that there's that. Uh, we've heard we've heard that story from the city with the and the reason why there's a new signal um, going in, um, and 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 that project. But um, this blind turn is is a little challenging. Um, unfortunately, I think care is right at a zero lot line. Um, but we'll, we'll take a look at it. You know, again, I want to appreciate the comments and and the sentiments. And now that we have this information, we'll take a look and see how we can maybe uh, perfect and and improve um, the condition that we're providing. Yes, I thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Tom, I wasn't aware that uh, Wineland Park had uh, palm trees. (laughs) (laughs) It's a new feature. (laughs) All right, our next question is going back to Laura. Yeah, this question is just really quick. I was wondering if you could um, point out where the walk-up apartments are going to be on this. Um, it's these three, these six units will all have a walk-up condition. Um, we just haven't progressed and, and worked through some of the, the architects. These are kind of placeholders for what space planning uh, blocks, but um, we would create kind of a stoop and walk-up condition. Um, with a doorway and access almost like a front door to a townhome, um, you know, at, at, at those front areas. And then also that same access off of for the rear areas as well. Nice. Um, I I walk quite a bit down Summit Street. And um, if you look at the building at the northwest corner of Summit and Fifth Avenue, um, it is not the world's most attractive building. But um, when we were talking about the design of that building prior to the building, we really asked for there to be walk-up access to some of the uh, living spaces on that west side of Summit. And um, I still really enjoy walking by them. It's a nice um, little walk up a few steps to an elevated doorway. So if you haven't looked at that building on the northwest corner of Summit Street and East Fifth, you might just take a look. Uh, absolutely, we can take a look at that, and um, I can share some images of a similar project style that we've created. That type of walk-up configuration that uh, definitely interacts with the street. It's almost like an inline townhome. Um, the way that it interacts with the street, and um, I apologize if I think it was Ted with Karina. Um, we'll take a look at what we can maybe do to um, maybe mimic. Um, a similar condition on the on the other the right parcel, if you will, um, we might be able to flip a flip a unit sideways um, and get more frontage, um, but stay out of the drive lane of the parking garage and just uh, flip flop parking. Uh, we could put maybe some more parking in the rear of the left parcel to maybe get uh, the the three units on the left to to work out you know on the f- street frontage of of four. So we'll take a look at that. Um, we've done that before as well. Um, uh, it gets a little tricky, but it's something that uh, hearing the feedback and comments, we'll try to see if we can interject. Wonderful. All right, uh, we'll wrap up with the last question going back to the Martins, and then we'll have to end for the night. Hey, how you doing? Uh, my name is Bill, resident of Hamlet Street. Um, a, a few, just kind of a trifold question here, sorry. Um, and really more on design intent. Uh, one, um, was there contemplated all the uh, use of balconies on any of the units? If if so, why did you stray away from that? Um, two, it may just be the plans that we have, but it doesn't appear that any of the walk-ups actually have access to the units. So it looks like that's all interior corridor access. Um, is that accurate or is that just a design rendering issue that we have? And then three, what's your intent on electrification? Are you planning on having natural gas applied to all of the units in the building or is it going to be solely electric? Uh, yeah, so uh, first question, um, uh, with the walk up, as I described to, to Laura, um, these are just placeholding blocks for, I'll call it spatial configurations of studios ones and twos. We haven't finally laid out and designed those units. Um, we would have access off of a rear corridor and off of the street frontage as well. So they'd have dual entrances um, and and there would be, you know, interaction. So right now, the, the I'll say the cross, uh, the sidewalk, uh, coming up to the building is probably fairly accurate that there'll be a walk to each one of these units. Um, the location uh, will maybe be shifted or adjusted as we kind of uh, fine tune that design. Um, 
these buildings uh, typically uh, do not have any elect uh, gas. Um, they're typically electric only uh, for the multifamily product. The, the HVAC units and everything run uh, electric only. So uh, I don't think we'll have gas to this building at all unless there's a commercial user that needs it from a retail per you know, restaurant perspective. Um, and then I apologize, I, I forgot the third question. Oh, you're asking about balconies. Um, how do you so, thought about that concept? Um, balconies are something that we've we've talked about um, and we've looked at. Um, sometimes we we find that uh, they're nice to has, but they aren't heavily, fully utilized heavily. Um, community areas, large communal areas, end up getting utilized more um, by our residents. But uh, it's something that we are looking at as a study to see if we were to add a handful um, of balconies, you know, at the corners or at prominent locations on the building. Um, so that's something that we're doing, going through a study right now, actually, independently. They really don't. All right, uh, any other questions before we wrap up here? Uh, Brandon, do you mind like flashing up uh, your company's contact information in case our residents may have questions um, after this meeting? Yeah, not a problem. I'll put my uh, email and phone number in the chat and feel free to reach out. I don't know if um, oh, the chat feature may not be. Yeah, um, you may not be able to see the chat feature in this meeting for some reason. So it's uh, it's my email is pretty easy. It's Brandon, uh, B R A N D O N, at Geisco, G E I S C O, dot net, um, and then uh, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, Can you say that one more time, Brandon? Yeah. Yes, it's Brandon, B R A N D O N at Geiss Co, G E I S C O as in company, dot net. All right, I want to thank everyone for attending um, and we'll wrap up for the evening. Thanks uh, for joining the meeting tonight. Thank Appreciate you everyone for your time. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.